Thank you for tuning in to Afro Vegan Society's celebration of United Nations World Food Day, featuring the panel, What Would a Just and Sustainable Food System Look Like? Support Afro Vegan Society's work by donating today. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in the 2020 World Food Day event being sponsored by or being hosted by Afro Vegan Society. I am so glad to be here today uh, putting on this amazing and exciting panel discussion uh, with some of the leading, most innovative and um, creative food justice activists that are currently out here working right now trying to address uh, some of these uh, inequities in our food system. So today's panel is called What Would a Just and Sustainable Food System Look Like? And so we want to uh, kind of talk about the current food system uh, during this panel discussion and then talk about some of our work and then our views uh, about what uh, a just and equitable system could look like uh, once these issues are addressed. So first and foremost, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists today and, um, and tell you a little bit about them and then we'll get right into the discussion. So we have Javonna Johnson Cook, who is the owner and co-founder of My Two Foods LLC, a vegan meal delivery service and vegan nutrition education hub. Through My Two Foods, she is working to develop culturally appropriate and accessible educational materials that highlight the benefit of healthy nutrition through a vegan diet. The My Two Foods Mother's Meal Program works to provide women, especially those in modest means households, with the knowledge and guidance to achieve a healthy pregnancy and optimal postpartum recovery through a vegan meal and nutrition program. So thank you so much, Giovanna, for being with us today. We also have Lauren Ornelas, who is the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project, a vegan food justice nonprofit that seeks to create a more just world by helping consumers recognize the power of their food choices. FEP works in solidarity with farm workers, advocates for chocolate not sourced from the worst forms of child labor, and focuses on access to healthy foods in black and brown communities and low-income areas. And then we have Eugene Cook, who is an American-born father of four descended from indigenous farmers and African refugees. His unique perspective is based on 20 years of growing food in urban areas, as well as work study abroad in Africa, Jamaica, and Haiti. He is a founding member of Grow Where You Are, a collective, dynamic, full-service social enterprise in the field of local food systems. Grow Where You Are partners with organizations and individuals to bring food abundance to communities who value real food. They design, install, and maintain multiple public and private spaces where food is produced using organic and natural principles. They've trained residents in the dynamic form of urban agriculture for over 10 years, and they partner with organizations, institutions, and individuals to plant fruit orchards, develop farms, and assist in ecological restoration in areas that enhance the health, economics, and environmental benefits by creating local food abundance systems. Wowza. So... Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. And then uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I am Brenda Sanders. I am founder and executive director of Afro Vegan Society, which is a nonprofit organization that works to provide education and resources uh, to people in marginalized communities to help them to transition to vegan living, uh, as well as co-founder of Thrive Baltimore which is a community center in Baltimore that um, supports people in living um, healthier, kinder, more sustainable lifestyles, and co-owner of the Greener Kitchen, which is a deli, a uh, plant-based deli in Baltimore that provides um, low-cost, accessible vegan foods to people, um, and some other stuff, but um, that, <laughs> we'll start with that. That's right. And, <laughs> yeah. So much work to be done, so little time, right? So, yes. Um, so what would a just and sustainable food system look like? So um, I'm a food justice activist. I would consider everybody on this panel to be food justice activists, which means 
um, you know, that we, our work is about um, solving problems. Uh, and so I would say that in my work, and I can't speak for uh, the three of you, but in my work, um, I don't see a lot of people doing this work who are promoting plant-based eating. There's like, you know, a few of us scattered around the country and, and even around the, the world, but um, we're kind of few and far between. And so, um, and I've encountered people who are doing this work who look at me like I am, you know, speaking a foreign language or, or from Mars or something when I say that, you know, people and the planet um, and the, the animals that we share the planet with, just everybody here could benefit from creating an accessible, sustainable plant-based food system. Um, you know, when I go into meetings and say this, people really like are not very open and, and um, willing to accept that information. I don't know about um, how, how people respond to the three of you. Um, but I wanted to ask some questions about your work and just have you talk about what it is that you do. Um, and so I wanted to start with Giovanna. You created a plant-based school lunch program as well as a pregnant and postpartum uh, mother's meal program where you create nutritionally balanced plant-based meals for students and families. Um, this is work that is almost completely overlooked uh, by the vegan movement uh, in particular. And so I was wondering what made you focus part of your, because that's only a part of what you do. You do a lot of other stuff too, which we'll talk about uh, later, but what made you focus part of your plant-based food outreach on pregnant and postpartum women and children? Hmm. Well, can I just say first that if I was coming into this with um, even recognition that we would go unrecognized doing this work, then I would never ever ever I think embarked on it that was my motivation to be recognized right um especially considering that um just in the body that I'm in now that I've chosen this time around that that is a station that I was actually born into a station where whatever I do is more than likely going to be overlooked so that can never ever ever could never be the motivation for why we do the work that we do um and when it came to the focus on postpartum and pregnant mothers, there's different reasons that all connect. Um, one, mothers, the mothers of color are, I mean, we've seen the numbers, they're overlooked, they're disregarded, so they have higher um, rates of death, of uh, just trauma, postpartum and during pregnancy. And so really wanting to, also having been and being a, a pregnant mother, a postpartum mother, um, recognizing the need within myself to have sound nutrition, to have um, support. Um, and so knowing that within myself, I, I mean, I understood that, I mean, I, I couldn't be the only one, right? And so just wanting to be supported, um, to other women, to other mothers, um, and to children in this journey of just um, wanting to be your best self and knowing that part of that is based on how you eat and what kind of nutrition you're getting in. So the choice to do plant-based was because I am and have been for some time plant-based. It's just nice for so many reasons, but nutritionally for sure, right? Making sure that I get what I need. Um, this is the most sound diet. So when I approached looking at how I would share that with other people, it, it had to happen plant based because that's what makes sense, you know, in my mind. That's the most sound. That's the most um, what's the word? Uh, it causes the least harm. Um, so yeah, it was. I, I'm saying it kind of flipped because it's in my mind. It was a no brainer just because that's how I live, but I, I do, I, I don't mean it to come across as lightweight or flippant, but um, it's just, it's, it really was a no brainer. Like it's, it's within balance to me. Um, so if I'm going to give anything out, I'm, I want to give the best and the most balanced that I'm um, offering that I can give. So 
that was why they made the choice to have a plant-based program for mothers and for their children. Thank you. Thank you that for makes that. Sense. Yeah, <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, it really kind of sucks that um, I'm sure all of, all of us have experiences uh, where our work, first of all, is not seen as um, valuable. And then, you know, the hard work that we personally do and bring to the table is oftentimes overlooked. So I definitely feel you on that. And if I, and if I can add, that's, that's really, that's the piece, right? Is to know that we are disregarded and we're not seen as valuable. But coming to a place where I'm learning to value myself and to learn to value us as a people, right? Um, and so we deserve that. And so if, if, if I have come to the conclusion that we deserve that, then what I offer from myself is going to be what I believe that we deserve. And we deserve the best, right? We deserve to have the best nutrition. We deserve to ha position ourselves in a way nutritionally or just mentally and emotionally where we are, you know, coming from or living from a, a platform that is balanced and sound and healthy and that's going to promote us moving in that way in life and so yeah man so for, for me plant-based is that's i mean it's in tune with the earth oh. and we deserve to be in tune with the earth mm -hmm. and working with the earth and you know what i mean and deserve to have a position where we are saying to the earth we are here we are valuable we are working with you because we value you as well and so that's what to me, plant-based offerings can help introduce folks to just that way of thinking, just that way of living, right? So, yeah. Mm, all righty, we already getting into it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't even know if I mentioned um, that, and people could probably figure it out using common sense, but Giovanna and Eugene are husband and wife. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> That's why they're in the same screen. Um, <laughs> I did, I did want to just, you know, just go ahead and if anybody was curious about that, just go ahead and clear that up. Okay, so thank you, Giovanna. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lauren, one of the things um, that Food Empowerment Project does for low-income communities of color is that you will survey the community's access to healthy foods, and then you will conduct focus groups with local organizations and generate reports that can then be used to inform public officials and encourage policy changes. What prompted FEP to provide this kind of services to communities? Well, first of all, I want to go back to your comment about um, how people see vegan type food justice activism. And I will just agree with you in the sense that we applied for a grant working on this and the response we got was that they didn't feel that veganism was the path to food justice. Wow. Um, which I thought was very interesting because to me, how could it not be? Um, again, we all know the reasons why, but it was just shocking. But, you know, I have never found any of the communities we work with or the farm worker organizations we work with have a problem with the fact that we're a vegan organization. Like uh -huh. the people on the ground don't have a problem with it. It may be the people in the offices who do, but the people who are on the ground don't because they appreciate it. Uh -huh. um, so I'll say that, I mean, as somebody, you know, I've been vegan since 1988, and I went vegetarian for the first time when I was in elementary school. But I wasn't able to stick with it because we didn't have a lot of money, right? So I hate to admit this, but some of the reason why we started doing this work was a little bit reactionary, right? Because we started to see white groups go into black and brown communities and start talking about veganism without any recognition on their part that that doesn't mean that everybody has the same access to the healthy foods that maybe these privileged vegans have. So it was kind of like me being in elementary school and eventually you know, having to eat the food that people brought us from the churches or whatever, knowing I couldn't stick with being vegetarian. You know, I was in elementary school. I couldn't really like have a job and get my own food. 
So the reality of recognizing that I felt guilty when I had to eat a chicken patty or something like that, because that's what they brought us from the church. So seeing white organizations go into black and brown communities and doing the outreach, the justified outreach on veganism and how animals are treated that the way that they are, but not recognizing that that's putting a lot of guilt on people who don't even have access to fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. And so to me, it was kind of like, well, we got to change that dynamic. One, you shouldn't be going into these communities because you don't belong there and you don't fit. But two, how can we then look at this in a way and say, if we want everybody to be able to go vegan, we need to make sure that those foods are accessible, right? And you can't do that. You can't just sit there and say, go vegan when people can't even get fruits and vegetables. I mean, it's horrendous that some vegans will say things well, like they can eat rice and beans. Well, are they going to eat rice and beans all day long? And is that really healthy for people? So, you know, this arrogance that came in made me realize, you know, plus I was living in one of these communities, right? I had two liquor stores across the street from each other where I lived and where I worked. And so I decided that, you know, it was important to go into the, well, in my community where I lived and see if it was a problem or not. And it was. And, you know, we started creating the, you know, going out and physically serving every establishment. And the reason, one of the reasons why we had to do it is because we were not only serving for fruits and vegetables and making sure that they were culturally appropriate for the communities, but we were also serving for meat and dairy alternatives. And as you stated, that isn't something that anybody else was really doing. So we had to be the ones to do that. And we created the reports to share with policymakers to help encourage them to have data to prove what we were saying wasn't just a we think. It was like, this is factual evidence and you can't refute it. It comes from your community and you owe it to the community to do something about it. But we also created these reports in order for community groups who were working on these issues to be able to raise more money. You know, in Vallejo, which is one of the communities we're working in right now that we were asked to by um, one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party to take a look at that community, um, we made sure we had extra reports printed from the community garden that was there so that they could go to their funders and say, this report is showing why our work is absolutely necessary for this community. So, you know, we, we started doing this work because it was, it's a justice issue, right? You can't, to ignore the lack of access to healthy foods is ignoring uh, a, a form of racism and systemic racism that in my opinion, has been a little bit off the radar, even when you look at environmental justice issues. I mean, each EJ issue is incredibly important, but for some reason, when you look at food access, it's not always part of that same equation like it should be. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, <laughs> absolutely. And I have personally looked through, um, you know, the, the Vallejo, report and it is just it's so comprehensive and so beautifully done by the way <laughs> um and and it's also available on your website um the food empowerment yes. project website so folks can go on there and check it out as well and i will add just really quick we did pay everybody 50 dollars for their time for participating and fed them a vegan meal because we think too often it seems like people's wisdom and their learned experiences are taken for granted and we wanted to make sure to reimburse people for their knowledge because their knowledge is valuable and worth something. And so that's why we felt we definitely needed to give them some type of stipend for, for their time that they gave us. That's awesome. Cause I've been a part of a couple of different um, focus groups and nobody gave me anything. So uh, <laughs> they said, thank you at the end. <laughs> so that is amazing. Um, and thank you, Lauren, for that insight. So Eugene, Grow where you are. First of all, I um I I didn't know that you were such a big deal. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, like you kind of know because you because I mean I've had other people come and be like, oh, do you know e Eugene? I'm like, yeah, I know Eugene. I know Eugene. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but but um as I was doing a little bit of research um into grow where you are, I mean, there's so much information out there about you, about the work you've done from like right now all the way to like way back and like you know, like you are definitely somebody who people look to, um, you know, as an expert in your field. 
Um, so I wanted to ask you a question about specifically about Grow Where You Are. Um, Grow Where You Are is committed to creating local food abundance systems worldwide by offering veganic argo ecology training and life skills workshops for evolving urban dwellers into global stewards. I mean, that's so big. That's huge. It's just saying so much there. And so I wanted to ask you, why do you do the work that you do? Like, why do you feel like it's so necessary? <laughs> this is perfect. Um, I'm grateful, Brenda. Thank you for being, um, making these kind of opportunities available. And thank you for asking questions that matter. Uh, as you spoke to us offline about how important it is to have someone moderating a discussion like this who also has the lived experience and the knowledge. So it, it brings the level of conversation up. So I hope for everyone who's watching and tuning in, we can start um, to really dig deep. So the question about why Grow Where You Are does what we do, we do it from the perspective of knowing that service is really one of the highest, um, highest and initial forms of spiritual development. And so all of us as people of color, we service is built into our tradition, the traditions of our families, multi-generational families living amongst each other, the way we have cared for our children. But these are the core values that were ripped from us during colonization and, and enslavement, um, or attempted to be ripped from us. The way in which we kept our connection to service, which helps us to evolve spiritually into and towards freedom is by working with the land. Um, and I learned that intimately through my maternal grandparents. My mother's parents were farmers in Kansas and Oklahoma, and they demonstrated to me through example how important it is to stay connected with nature, observe nature, and make sure that our time is spent in a useful way. My folks used to say to me all the time, make yourself useful. Make yourself, Eugene, make yourself useful. And I'm really only now getting to understand how deep that, um, that phrase is and how much meaning there is into it. Because now that we see ourselves in a, in a global economic lockdown that is, that is based on psychology as well as science, as well as all these things that are happening at the, at the same time, the importance of Grow Where You Are's work is even more striking than it ever has been because our idea has always been, well, wherever you are, grow something because we haven't stopped eating. Um, we, ne we don't seem to get depressed enough to forget to eat and shop. We don't seem to get oppressed enough to forget to eat and shop. So if we know that this is, this is part of being involved in an economic system that has so closely tied our, as Giovanna talked about and as Lauren talked about, our nutrition in, in this society is so closely enmeshed with finance. And so, and finance and class are not able to be separated from race in the United States. So I'm thinking, well, I didn't have the money to go out and give money to the people that I thought should have money, but I did have the skill set to be able to create one of the most essential commodities that we tend to, to purchase with money. So it's like cutting out the middleman and getting right to, well, look, since we're not gonna rob these banks and we, we haven't come up with these, these schemes of how to get all this money and pass it around for free, let's make sure that the, that the thing that our ancestors gave us, which is a connection with the earth and a sensitivity and an awareness to pay attention to the cycles of life, let's make sure that we're activating that. Because if we activate that, then we can make some of the financial hurdles in between less and less relevant as, as time goes by, because they're eating themselves anyway. This, these financial systems are cannibalizing themselves at this moment. Uh. And we all still got families. We all still are here. We all still have friends and communities that we're responsible to. What's going to happen? I mean, when, when, when Food Empowerment Project does a sur the multiple surveys that you've done, what we get is the clarity of how vulnerable we are. And for us to be vulnerable as farm workers, for us to be vulnerable as, as the people who created the agricultural system in the United States, that shows how um, strategic the attack on us has been. 
And so we have to be as strategic with our response to it. And that's our work. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Best. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is so okay. Yeah, I've I've actually been on a couple of not on, but I've watched a couple of um food justice sort of panel discussions um that have been coming out, you know, since the the pandemic started and I don't know. I I haven't really felt like anybody tackled the like the real issues. Mostly it's just a bunch of folks from nonprofits, you know, trying to justify their grant money but that's a whole other you know that, <laughs> that's a whole other thing we could do a panel discussion about that no uh -huh. <laughs> i'm like yeah let it go <laughs> you moderate it lauren. <laughs> yeah my, lauren can moderate <laughs> i'll watch <laughs> Okay, so, um, and this is, uh, we're going to stay with Eugene for the next question because it's very, very relevant to what you just said. Um, people ask me a lot, like, what inspired you? What inspired you, you know, to do this work? And for me, it was obviously the fact that I've seen firsthand um, how the our food system specifically targets low income, um, and, and for me, um, black urban communities with this cheap unhealthy packaged you know animal products that you know they just dump them by the truckload into our communities and then they do generational harm you know i mean I, the the foods that i ate growing up in the projects you know were the same foods that were av available to my mother and the same foods that are still available to the next generation, right? And so, and then we see all of these health disparities that exist, um, you know, with uh, low-income folks, low-income brown and black folks. And it's like, no wonder, because our communities are being specifically targeted. Um, Eugene, can you talk about specifically the disconnect between the people and the planet in urban settings and what your work you know and how your work is working to change that wow that's a hell of a question brenda brenda <laughs> there's so many things that i want to hit on i want to answer your question and i also want to acknowledge the some of the very important points you made i want to punctuate them along with the food being cheap and available it's addictive and if we don't acknowledge the fact that we are being targeted with addictive chemical substances, which is no different than bringing alcohol to the Africans and the indigenous Americans here, knowing that because of our unique gifts of our chemical makeup, we are more susceptible to these toxins. So this fast food is not only cheap and available, it's addictive. And so then, yes, we do have generational uh, health consequences from that. As far as our disconnection in urban areas, I've grown food from uh, South Central LA to Pomona, California, to Atlanta, Georgia. And the thing that is consistent is that when we are in um, the urban areas, we are under high levels of stress. And that can be like very immediate tactile stress of hunger or abuse or police brutality, or it can just be the overall everyday hum of the stress of the toxic air, the unclean water, the noise pollution. There's so many other things that are happening. So the body is already releasing all of this chemical soup within itself and circulating it within itself. Whereas when humans and animals, for that matter, are living in a natural environment and we are under stress, simply by being out in the sun or touching the earth with our bare feet or taking a swim in some water, we are able to chemically rebalance our system by releasing free radicals and absorbing free electrons. That can also happen through the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. So again, to look at Lauren's work or to look at what Giovanna is doing, when these school lunches go out to these youth, not only are they plant-based, but so much of it is fresh food. That is actually bringing, an urban bringing nature into that urban child's world. If, I, if I'm an urban child and I get fruit roll-ups or I get a fresh apple chopped up, 
the difference. Now, nutritionally, you might be getting the same nutrition, but info informationally to the body, when that apple is in its whole fresh state and just sliced and you eat it, or orange and just sliced and you eat it, it comes with all the information of the outside natural world that you may not be experiencing um, as an individual. So when we, the, the more processed the food gets inside of an already de detached environment where we're wearing rubber shoes and we're blocking ourselves from the, the resonance of the earth, or we are um, spending a lot of time indoors under fluorescent lights. We're blocking ourselves from the residents of the earth. And now here we are, we're in the middle of a lockdown where people are mandating that people stay inside, mandating that people don't go to work, mandating that people stay away from each other. In the ghetto, the most natural, uh, no, I'm saying the most frequent experience of the natural world is black and brown people touching each other's bodies. That, that is part of our dance and our sexuality and all that because we took a bunch of people who were used to being in the fields and in nature, put them in an urban environment. The most natural thing to us is the human body. That's what's reminding us of nature. If we're in concrete jungle, so we find ourselves wanting to interact, wanting to gather, wanting to touch, wanting to dance. And now all of those things, year after year, generation after generation, we are being um, splintered away from, right? We're being more isolated into our uh, devices, more isolated indoors, less gatherings. I mean, I have a niece who's 17 years old and here it is pandemic time. She's not going to a school dance. She's not thinking about a prom. Nature is us. We are nature. So if we get repressed, oh, it's a further disconnect because we're already not going outside. So the way we balance that is by making sure that we are partnering with churches that are in areas, schools that are in areas that are right there in the community and creating spaces that people are walking by and seeing every day and that are open. They're not fenced in, they're not protected, they're open. Hey, come in here, take your shoes off, sit down, relax. You don't have to come and do work. It doesn't have to be a volunteer kind of situation. Just come in and enjoy the space, get some sun, recharge. That is some of the most crucial work we've done is by making agro, agricultural spaces available to the people of our community. So they can see the food growing, but more importantly, they can just find a place to be outside and reconnect. Yeah, I was uh, talking to Giovanna recently about um, the fact that in the work that we're doing, um, I feel like creating green spaces and creating um, green food spaces should be a much bigger component yes. in what we're doing. You know, we're addressing uh, food issues, but, um, and, and we have built community gardens and sort of uh, handed those over to the community. Um, and, you know, and the community continued to engage with the garden. It was beautiful. But I think that in order for us to really have um, a comprehensive plan that gardening and um, being close to, to the earth needs to, to play a much bigger part in that. So I will definitely be back, you know, in touch with you, Eugene, and, and, and looking at ways um, to collaborate. And, and I know that you already have these training programs and, and stuff in place. So, you know, once we're allowed to come back outside again, um, <laughs> I would love to participate in that. And um, I would love to pass that information on to other people who I'm sure would love to participate in, as well. So thank you for that. Can I add something just mm -hmm. like to bring in the two of you guys' points together or like what you guys hit on is that, um, so in, especially since we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday, um, well, I think we should be celebrating that <laughs> forever and ever, every day, because that's how we have learned and been able to survive being here in this space. But when you look at, like, where the disparities, when the disparities came in, um, the disease and just the, the trauma and just all the things that are affecting people of color's communities right now, the initial step that catapulted, catapulted us into all this, this drama that we find ourselves in is with the separation of, of people from their land. 
So you look at any documentary, you look at any study, and, and when you have people who have health disparities and they have um, um, mental disparities, you, what happened to those people first? If you don't, from the people, the First Nations and from Australia to the First Nations here and the folks of African descent is, it was a separation of the people from their land. And when you separate them from their land, of course you separate them from their food and nutrition, from their cultural connections to the earth that kept them grounded and kept them, you know, with the focus and with an environment in which to thrive. And so, I mean, and especially considering what the work that we do with young people who are now urbanized, what so much of the work is about, why, yeah, I would definitely encourage you to, you know, create green spaces and align is because we, in order for us to heal, we have to, in my mind, have that reconnection with the earth. That was the first, I mean, for lack of a better word, that was the first sin. That was the first, like, offense that happened. Not sin, because that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but the first offense that happened, right, is that we were taken from our land. It was ripped from us. And when you ripped, you, you, you ripped our life force, you ripped us from being able to understand the power and the cooperation of living and working with animals, right? So, of course, we have that whole, you know, right. whole mess, right? Where we have systems where animals are enslaved, right? And we're, we're having to do work to teach people how to be in harmony with nature. Like, of course, we, I mean, of course, if we've gotten to that point, right? Because we, we ripped ourselves. No, not we didn't rip ourselves. No, we didn't. We were an oppressive force ripped us from natural living and natural environment. And so the work that we're, the reason the work is so tedious is because we're having to retrain and reprogram ourselves to natural ways. Mm. Because we've been living in the disease state since that first, you know, infraction. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, creating the green spaces and um, teaching people, if not to farm, but just to be out in nature, it connects, it helps to connect all the dots so that we're not like, the work is not as hard, right? So, because when, when, especially if a child goes outside and they're like, oh, and they can see the deer migrating and moving around and they see themselves within that environment with the deer, they understand cohabitation. They understand cooperation, right? And it's not something that we have to, <clears throat> studies for, and you know, just have these big activism platforms for to get, we have to just remind people and remind them by putting them in the environment mm -hmm. that, hey, we all live and work together in harmony. We are all, you know, inhabitants of the earth. It's like that, and that's a natural order. I think in some regards, it's, it's also difficult. Um, like for one thing is a lot of, I mean, a lot of us who are native, you know, are working the land, right? At least right. In, in the United States. So we are working the land, but because of capitalism, because of being treated like commodities, because of racism, we are, but we're still disconnected from the land, right? We can't right. own the land that was rightfully ours, honestly. Right. That right. land is ours. And we no longer, we're like, we're the, the, the workers, and there's no joy in that because of how all the other systems, the pay, the, you know, the discrimination, the sexual harassment, whatever it is in the fields. And then you also have a flip side, too, of immigrants who are in fear of being outside right now, right? Like, if they're undocumented, then they don't want right. to be outside. They don't want to be seen. In fact, they're not even going to get their essential needs taken care of because of the climate right now is encouraging them to stay inside, right? So they, another way, again, COVID or not, people were fearful because of the environment, because of ice, that if they step outside, they could be deported and going back to a country that they, you know, were in when they were maybe one years old or something. So I think it's just another way that some people though, aren't gonna be able to go out and connect with the land. And another way in which people are working on the land but are deprived of, their ancestral land in a way in which they would like to maintain it. So, so, thank you for that one. Yes, sure. So, actually, 
Yeah, my, my next question, um, wow, this is so perfect how everything is kind of flowing um, into each other because, um, well, first off, uh, Giovanna, um, just going back to what you were saying, um, Awali. Hmm. You and Eugene created a Wally, which um, was described to me as a vegan homestead training center and business incubator where people can come to learn a wide variety of life skills from plant-based cooking and gardening to herbal healing and meditation What mo and, and much more. Uh, what motivated you to want to build a space like that that would offer these kinds of trainings? <laughs> Well, the first motivation, I think, is because we, need, we needed it, right, for our own healing um, and to be able to have a space to do this work from, right, um, in order for us to be able to go out into the world and share, you know, from, from our talents and from, you know, what it is that we have to offer, we needed a space to be able to, you know, come out of, right? And so that would be the first motivation is just our own health and security. Um, but then with the understanding that like we can't have true health and true security when those around us within our community are not healthy and are not have no security. And so Awali um, was created in that spirit just to create a space for ourselves and for others to come and to, even if it's just for moments to be able to heal, to be able to learn, to be able to come into themselves in a safe environment and to recognize their gifts and their talents and the offer that they have to give to the planet and then have the support to be able to do that in a successful way from being in this space and being around people who are of like minds and even if the, their focus is different they have the willingness to share in their skills to help assist other people to go out and you know do their thing so a, a while was just created out of the spirit of just needing and wanting to share and let, let, allowing people to see that abundance exists but it exists when you cultivate it mm. and you nurture it and also there's abundance in community and yeah you can oh, yes. <laughs> but i know you 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 have a more um mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you can javana because me i i i'm i'm so <laughs> so much sometimes i'm so much in the feeling of a thing right so that my words don't come out in a way that is, is as concise because I'm so much into the vibration and the feeling of it. What it's beautiful. Is. No, you, it was wonderful. <laughs> it, yeah, you did great. I um, I actually came down. I came down only for like a few hours, though. It was very sad. It was <laughs> because you know I was down there, you know, to speak at a veg fest, and you know, th time just got away from me, and so I was only able to. Uh, spend a few hours down there with y'all and I gotta say like you know the veg fest stuff it stressed me out I was stressed out as I was driving over because you know the, the south stresses me out um and it really does <laughs> and so, so I kind of I got lost a little bit and everything and and um but even like as I was coming down the road that leads to Owali I felt myself relaxing and it was, it was really, um, it, it was, it was very noticeable. Like I felt my shoulders noticeably like coming down and like, you know, the stress in my body was alleviated. And by the time I got down to the property and, you know, I was <laughs> welcomed by the children because they were like the first ones coming out like, Hey, and I was like, wow. I mean, it was just it was such a, a beautiful experience and then you know the house is beautiful the land it was kind of it was already um dark by the time i got down there, so i didn't even get like the full i mean i i, I like i definitely follow slash stalk y'all on social media so i know like how beautiful the land is and and i feel like i'm there oftentimes when i'm watching the videos um but you know just the energy down there was different 
it was different. Like people need to understand, like y'all are doing something different down there. And it felt so good and so relaxing. The atmosphere was so relaxing. And like, I was floating when I left to go back, you know, to my hotel room. <laughs> it was, it was really a, a very, it was, that was her choice. Remember that. So I know. That was her know. choice to go back to her hotel room. <laughs> It's the South. I was scared. But no, that, that won't happen again. Like, I have every, <laughs> every intention. I want to come down there, and I want to experience the full Owali experience. Yeah, Lauren, you come too. Bring yeah, I would Lauren. love to. Yeah. I would, oh. yeah. And, that, and that's the thing, like, that's that's what I, I, that I, I couldn't, I can't capture in words, but that, what you just described, we all deserve that feeling right we all deserve that and so if a wally can serve just for folks especially the folks who are doing this work i mean y'all are doing it right like, come to come here and just and have breathe. that feeling of i can breathe because you deserve that you deserve to know and feel that i am a part of this earth and it it can nourish me and i you, and you, it's like we don't have to be victims here we don't have to be afraid for our life here we can work and our work can be seen as valuable and useful right and it can it can you can see the ramifications of what you put out into the earth when you hear at least that's that's been the example for like for me or the experience for me like when folks come here and we work together and we share ideas together and we so say somebody who's like just feeling insecure in, in their activism or what it is that they're doing and you see just face to face in the moment how your words or your skill sharing affects another person or affects the environment to have that experience like when you can then walk away when you walk away from a wally if you can go with just that in your heart and in your spirit like that can mean that can mean and has meant for a lot of people that you know have had this experience. It's meant the meant the world for them in their work. Because we've seen folks come here and be a part of our programs, or stay here for uh, what, what's the word that you call it? The residency. Yeah, apprenticeship residency. And then go off to create businesses oh to create God. all of their lifestyles and have influence within their own communities. My have goodness. their whole lives changed, right? And, and we deserve that. We deserve that. We deserve to have places where we are supported, right? And where we can have comfort, even if it's for, for a moment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to hear that you've had that experience. So, I mean, like, let's keep it moving. Because this work, it's not easy work. And we need places where we can just breathe for a moment. And if you stop the work, ain't nobody going to care. Because there's so many folks who want us to stop the work. You know <laughs> what I mean? And if you stop and get worn out, people might... Boo hoo for a minute, but then that'll be it. Now and and nobody nobody's prepping anybody behind you or none of that kind of stuff. It's strictly the inspiration of the work that's going to prep people to come up behind us. And we gotta. It can't all be horrible because who wants to do that? You know? Right. So yeah, Wally is a school, but Universe Building is a rejuvenation space. It's a healing space for the healers and. I pray that you, when I'm speaking to the two of you, specifically right now, know that you are healers. Your work, I mean, it is activism. You're warriors, but you are healers because the work that you do is to heal. And stuff that already yeah, happened. Man. Things that we, didn't, that we didn't ask to happen to us. Otherwise, what would you, I mean, we all would have totally different lives if we weren't having to uh, re respond, react to traumas and oppression. Where, then what would we do? Right. Who would we be then? And I'm sure we're activating it in our own lives, our creative things and all that kind of thing. But imagine if so much of it wasn't of our energy and life force wasn't dominated by responding to a society that we didn't create, mm. that we just find ourselves in. It's, oh, Lord have mercy. I'm feeling so emotional right now. Yeah, I know, me too. I'm like, stop, I don't want to cry. I'm going to answer questions. <laughs> I'm sobbing. But thank you. It's, I'm trying to let it sink in. I think it's really hard to um, think that we're allowed to enjoy. I mean, at least it's my 
thing. There's probably a lot of things tied up into that, but I'm trying to let it sink in. And Giovanna, hearing you talk about it with such righteousness, but heart really helps me be like, it's like it's trying to permeate. And so I thank you for that, even though it's very, very hard, but it's very hard. So thank you, Giovanna. I agree. It's very hard to get Lauren to to uh, accept that she <laughs> deserves all the wonderful things. So it's hard to get me to accept it, and I'm and I'm saying it's you know what I'm saying it's easier to say it to other people than it is even to accept yep. it to myself because I'm Absolutely. sitting around in this, and sometimes it's even hard just to stop to take a moment to just breathe in this space because. Mm -hmm. Uh, I allow myself to be like, okay, well, we got to focus on the work, 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 on the work. But I stop. I don't, I don't uh, stop often enough to just say, hey, you're here. It's like I'm saying to you, you deserve to heal. You deserve some breathing space. You deserve to have happiness and you deserve to have joy in this, right? I mean, we have enough of Russo. having to do the work almost like just begging hey support what it is that we're doing because we're actually doing it for your benefit we're trying to do it for your benefit mm -hmm. you have enough with men trying to figure out how to get this grant to make this thing work and it's 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 work it's almost like you're at in a battle right so we deserve the space and time to just take a step back from all that and that wow. same that same thing that motivates us to do this work to cultivate that for our own rejuvenation and regeneration, yes. right? To cultivate that for our creative pursuits, right? N not just for the cleanup and the, you know what I mean? <laughs> I do, yeah. I do. My whole, the whole scope of my work is about the cleanup. Right, but, what you, <laughs> but, the, but the skill that you utilize for the cleanup, that skill in the, that's a power. That's a, there's a beauty in that, right? And imagine if you had the space to cultivate that with your creativity and even uh, had the space to allow that offering, right, right, to the world. Because that offering, that gift is just as essential and just as vital as what you use in that energy for the cleanup, right? Because you're not just here to work to clean up somebody else's mess. You're here... Shh. You're here to realize yourself and utilize what you realize to give to the earth as well. So, man, it's like we got to learn how to put the, you know, put the energy. I mean, we, yeah, we got, we have that work, but we also have the work of realizing ourselves and our create creativity and, and creativity in the sense of being able to create or co-create with this earth, right? And that we need that offering from you just as much as we need you working and cleaning up. You know what I mean? So yeah, Awali, okay. is, Awali is here to support you in that. We may not, <laughs> it may not be fully achieved and accomplished here, but it's here to support you in that work as well. So that's what is. I'm ready. I'm <laughs> ready, Lauren. Yeah, do it. Road trip. <laughs> so, so, um, and then Lauren, getting back to what you, um, were were talking about with, um with our, you know, our farm workers. You also, Food Empowerment Project also helps uh, to educate people about the conditions that the migrant workers who pick our produce, our vegan produce, <laughs> are being subjected to. Um, because I think a lot of times we, um, you know, people who are doing vegan work, animal rights work, um, will uh, focus on like slaughterhouses, you know, slaughterhouse, 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 um, and never really take much responsibility for um, the way that we consume, right? You know, when we go into grocery stores and markets. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell us more about um, the conditions that the farm workers um, are, are currently uh, having to, to deal with and what Food Empowerment Project is doing to help assist those families. Sure, and thank you. I mean, I think it's one of those things that we, when you decide to become a vegan organization and you're encouraging other people to go vegan, you can't ignore the impact that that has on produce and our demand for produce. And for those of us who went vegan for compassion and justice reasons for non-human animals, it's really ignorant for us to not then also think about our food choices and how it impacts farm workers. 
And I think that one of the frustrating parts is when people, when vegans want to use the word intersectional, and they only want to talk about the intersection of slaughterhouse workers and factory farm workers to try to get people to go vegan, and yet don't make that same connection when it comes to the food that they're eating. Because unless you're growing your own food, like Javon and Eugene might be, you are, you have a farm worker to thank for everything you're eating. And so it was, it's impossible for me now not to talk about veganism without talking about farm workers, because to me, they go hand in hand. There's no way to disconnect the two anymore for me. Um, farm workers, you know, the average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. So I'm 50. So I'm already beating the average lifespan of a farm worker um, because of the fact of their living conditions, their working conditions, many experience homelessness um, because they aren't being paid well enough. These are the same workers who are picking our produce who don't even have access to that produce that they're picking because of the cost. Um, those who live in labor camps um, are also victims sometimes of environmental racism because the one that I know of is in between a dump and a correctional facility. There's no buses that go out there. So the people who live out this far back out, um, that's where they have to stay. There's no way for the kids to go anywhere other than in that one area. Um, you know, you have sexual harassment being in, prevalent in the fields. There was a recent, which really struck me, there was a recent frontline um, segment on farm workers and COVID. And one of the women that they interviewed, who was a farm worker, was um, living with her mom and her sister, and she had a child. And her mom was elderly, her sister was a quadriplegic, and this young woman who was a farm worker, she had cancer. Mm. So every morning she would take her chemotherapy pills and then she would go and work in the fields. You know, and the reality of like anybody who's had cancer before ha hopefully has some understanding about what her body is going through and yet she still had to go work in the fields. She still had to go to work because she still had to be able to provide for her family. You know, and these realities are day to day for farm workers in this country. And um, again, our food system was never made for people like us, right? It was made to profit off of our backs. It was never made for us to be equal. And so all it's ever going to do is take, 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 take from us. And that is in all the different areas that you look at it from our consumption to the work that goes into it. And so food empowerment projects work um, along with and to, to elevate the voices of farm workers is done to, not as an act of charity. It's more done to help right an injustice that's taking place and more done to thank farm workers for feeding us. You know, and that's vegans and non-vegans alike. You know, everybody has a farm worker to thank. So we support boycotts called by farm workers themselves. We think that's one of the best things we can do to honor them is to listen to what they're asking for. So we honor the boycotts called by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers who asked for a boycott of Wendy's. Who cares if they have a vegan burger or not? Um, they're not paying the farm workers one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick, not signing on to the fair food program. And for any of your listeners who are in the, the Southeast, there's a grocery store called Publix. The same situation. I know you have in Atlanta. I remembered it from when I lived there. Um, Publix also is not, it is not respecting the request of one more penny per pound um, by the farm workers with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So that's something that people can do. We also support the San Quintin farm workers in Mexico who are asking for a boycott of Driscoll's berries. And Driscoll's berries are sold around the world. Um, and there were a lot of pop-up protests against Driscoll's berries here in California because um, they were not adhering by the COVID guidelines. So farm workers were being exposed um, because the, the company wasn't following the guidelines to protect them from COVID. So, you know, we think it's really important that we honor these. Um, we also work to promote legislation. We help change a regulation in California. Um, there was a regulation in California, which in essence was trying to create a cycle of poverty and oppression and creating more farm workers from farm workers. Um, very small percentage of farm workers live in labor camps. And when the picking season was over, they were required to move from that labor camp and move 50 miles away. So keep in mind that some of these pit planting and picking seasons end in November and they start up again in May. So in one of these labor camps, in order for the families who live there 
to be able to move back into that labor camp the next season, they had to move 50 miles away. So in November, they'd have to pull their kids out of school, move 50 miles away, go back to the labor camp in May, and expect their child to be able to have an education. So for over 20 years, one of the farm worker advocates who worked in the area, 20 years, only ever saw one child graduate from high school. So again, these systems are built in place. These aren't by accident. These aren't people who didn't think about it. They know what they're doing. And they're trying to continue to exploit off of black and brown and indigenous bodies. That's what they're seeking to do. One of the other things that we do, again, in order to give back to farm workers, is we do a school supply drive for the children of farm workers every year. And we get school supplies from all over, um, and we package them up, and we give them to the children of farm workers. We had to do it differently this year because of COVID. Um, but we were able to get 665 backpacks full of school supplies to the children of farm workers um, to show their kids what superstars that they are and that we want them to succeed. Um, a lot of the farm workers we work with are indigenous, um, so they don't even speak um, Spanish, which means that in everything in the system, they're an automatic disadvantage. Most of them are from Oaxaca and Mexico. And, um, you know, it's just our way of giving back because um, we have to change these systems. And my hope is that it's not about fixing the systems, it's about dismantling them and creating a new system in which really all of our people will be able to thrive because the current system can never do that. The, the people who um, created the rules and the government in this country, they knew what they were doing um, and they knew that they could create a system that would always put us in a place of need, right? One of the, let me just mention one more thing that infuriates me to no end. So right now I live in Sonoma County, a lot of wineries around here where you had during the fires that were going on, you had the wineries having farm workers working in mandatory evacuation zones. So these fires, these areas were deemed to be so bad that people had to leave. But yet the agricultural commissioner and the wineries were able to create this system to where that was okay for the farm workers to go in these areas. Again, somehow they weren't human and they could withstand working in these areas. Again, this misnomer that Oh, farm workers, like there's something special about them, that they're so strong, they can work in these fields and they heat and deal with the chemicals without accepting the fact that they're not superhuman. They're doing this for their families. And yet we have like white people like, oh, I could never do that work. Well, they don't exactly like the work. They're struggling. They're suffering. They're not superhuman. They're just doing it because they're families to survive. But what do the wineries do, right? The wineries and all of the, the, the um, growers aren't paying farm workers decent wages, right? <clears throat> so what do the wineries do to feel better about themselves? They put on galas where they raise money to give back to the farm workers. So they get to get all dressed up, get to have these fancy events to raise money for the farm workers that they themselves are not paying well enough. So they wouldn't need these handouts, right? But it's always about our people, right? Black and brown communities needing handouts from white people because they don't want to pay us well. They don't want to pay us our worth and our values, our values, our valuable experiences, our valuable labor. But again, it's always about them giving to us. So somehow it's the white savior, right? So somehow we'll always look at them as they're wanting our best interest at heart instead of the fact that they don't want to give us our due. They don't want to give us what we deserve and what we're worth. Uh. Uh -uh. And what's crucial, because I know that there are going to probably be some organizations, um, funding organizations who watch this, that it's, it's, you said it right, it's our, it's their due. It's not, they're not asking for a handout. They have worked, they have bled, they have died, they have sacrificed for this. So it's not like, you're, you're not giving them anything other than what they are already owed, over owed, exactly. you know what I'm saying? And that's, exactly. that's the whole, that's, I know it's a whole nother conversation. And that's my, cause I, my question that I'm sitting up here thinking about is like, so with all of these funding organizations who <laughs> spend and spread money amongst one another, like <laughs> what are they doing? 
<laughs> but don't we see the same thing in food justice, right? Don't we see the same thing that food banks get all this money when all they're doing is creating a Band-Aid instead of looking at the root of the problem? They don't want to look at the root of the problem. They want to always feel like they have to hand out to us. They always have to give to us instead of giving that money back to the community so they could grow their own food or have worker-owned cooperatives. That's some of the problem with food banks, right? Again, there's a lot of issues with food banks, but let's talk about the fact that that's a Band-Aid fix. Yeah. I, I, All this stuff to hand free food out never gets to the root of the problems. Especially right. since the workers who they're handing the food out to are the people who, who grew it, who grew it, who picked it, <laughs> who packaged it. Who sell it, it who, who sell it at the grocery stores, <laughs> who are the fast food workers who yep. are selling it, who are the workers at Walmart selling it. Those are yeah. all the workers they're giving that free food to who are actually the working poor. When I go into these meetings, uh, these food justice uh, meetings, there is so much talk about food relief. There's so much resources and so much time that's being thrown into food relief work. And I feel like that's different. That's not the same as food justice work because it's not solving any problems. As a matter of fact, it's propping up the problem, right? Exactly. Um, and, and you and see the same thing with the vegan groups, right? Some of these vegan groups are like, oh, we're just handing out this. Well, okay, well, but how is that helping the root of the problem? What are you doing to dismantle the systems that actually created this? Yep. And not only that, but we're starting to get pushback for like meal programs and things like that. Like, you know, it's not, it's not so much a focus anymore or that's, you know, they're looking at other methods. Yeah. Know, methods. And that's just, that's just going to happen. They don't the benefit so much of, like, of programs that actually feed people. Right. I encounter food justice activists all the time who believe that they're giving people more control over their food system uh, by promoting the use of backyard chickens for eggs and for meat, for, uh, you know, teaching them how to raise backyard goats for milk and for meat, even like how to raise rabbits and skin them. Like I had, we have folks here in Baltimore who do workshops and, and, and classes and stuff on like, you know, how to process, raise and process these animals um, as a way of, um, solving the issue of, um, you know, people in certain communities not having access to, um, excuse me, not, not access, um, as a way of uh, addressing the lack of power that people have over their food system, right? So, so like in the hood, for instance, we don't have any control over what food is, is brought into our communities. So what they're saying is, hey, you know, as a way of combating this, we're going to show you how to raise chickens for eggs. We're going to show you how to raise goats for meat, like that kind of thing. In the um, hood? Yeah, they're like starting to do you that. Don't, where you don't own the land that you're on. Yeah. You, yeah, you know, yeah. More than likely you're a renter. Mm-hmm. You Absolutely. share space with however many other tenants. <laughs> let her yeah. Let her, let her <laughs> What's your question? So... <laughs> I was going to ask you specifically um, about veganic farming. I don't know if many people know much about um, veganic farming or have even heard about it. Um, and, you know, what's your philosophy on using and teaching veganic farming as opposed to, you know, the methods that are usually used um, that utilize animals and animal byproducts? Again, you pref you you pref this question was something that was way more interesting to me than than this part of it. <laughs> I'm thinking like they teach people to kill the animals in the hood, like that's the how is that a I'm really confused. But um, as far as veganic farming goes, uh, veganic farming is something that I was practicing and didn't know that I was practicing it. And then there was a young woman named Ashley Caps of an organization called Well Fed World who then brought in the terminology and the explanation. But it was something we were already doing. It essentially means growing food without the byproducts of uh, slaughterhouse animals, without their manure, without their blood, without their bones, without their feathers. Typically, the blood, bones, feathers, and manure of animals in, in um, slaughterhouses are ground up and then distributed as fertilizer and poured back over the ground. So one of the things that Lauren made clear about food empowerment projects work is that 
if we're not taking into account um, the vegan produce and how vegan produce is, a, is impacted by farm worker injustice, it's the same thing with vegan produce is most of it is grown with animal fertilizers and blood and bone and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's a matter of like convenience that people are dealing with what is convenient to their own psychology and their own consciousness and then saying that it's vegan. When it comes to veganic growing, it's a lot easier to gather up our own plant-based food scraps, our own yard waste and things like that and create um, viable fertilizers, nutrient-dense fer fertilizers that can help plants to grow. The forest is not being supported because there are huge amounts of animals defecating in the forest. The forests are being supported because each year they drop their own leaves. Each year they drop their own limbs and those limbs and leaves are then food for fungi and the fungi are the, the mycelium mat that transmits all types of nutrition, sugar, water, um, bacteria. So we work a lot with creating healthy fungal environments, um, a lot of home composting, a lot of the, uh, veganic composting that doesn't have any animal manures in it. But of course, our systems, because they are biodiverse systems, they still have earthworms in those systems. There's still animals and squirrels and birds are in those systems. So there are still animal inputs, but the animals are not tortured animals that are inputting into the system. They're animals that benefit from the system, the birds that fly into our food systems and eat from our sunflowers and to, to the area. They're there by choice. They're not there because they're being tortured or raised as food. Um, and I, I do want to, if I can, segue into what you had brought up. When we're talking about urban environments and, and urban dwellers, um, again, I've, you know, I've dwelled in a lot of different places, a lot of different urban cities. In 1992, when Rodney King was beaten by the police, I was coming home from college and I saw the video on TV. And at the time, one of my good brothers had a young daughter and they were living in Compton. I immediately went to Compton to see what was happening. And the streets were burned. The riots had happened after the, the, uh, the police were acquitted and, and found not guilty. And I went to his kitchen and we opened up the refrigerator and in the refrigerator he had 64 ounce jugs of malt liquor now this is 92 and in 92 everybody was drinking 40 ounces all the rappers were promoting 40 ounces 40 ounces of old english 40 ounces of saint ides i had the only 64 ounce glass jugs i had seen were apple, apple cider we opened up the refrigerator and there's apple cider i mean apple cider sized jugs of malt liquor 40 uh, uh, Colt 45 and all this kind of stuff. I said, what, where did this come from? He said, when the riots hit, they started putting these 64 ounce glass jars full of malt liquor into the liquor stores, which meant somebody had bottled it, labeled it, and had it ready to go. I've never seen that before or since, but I saw this with my own eyes. I saw a food system, like Lauren talked about, that is designed to take from us rape us and debilitate us and they know what they're doing so the moment the riots hit when people started busting down the doors and all that kind of stuff they had 64 ounces of malt liquor available for people to steal and take home and put themselves into a sedated state so people who are living in urban areas to slaughter animals rather than to utilize our public schools yeah as places of food production. Right now during COVID, when the public school systems around the country have been shut down, we should be replanting these football fields and all this, this wasted space at our public schools with fruit orchards, grape vines, berry, berry orchards. We should be putting in perennial herbs and medicinal gardens because the public schools are public land that are ours as the public. Every public library could be replanted with a fruit orchard. All these public hospitals should have edible landscaping. We should not be paying people to water grass and cut grass and then water grass and then cut grass and then be feeding the people in the hospital Jello, Chick-fil-A. Chick -fil We've had some, some emergency issues within our own family and 
I was, it was everything I could do to keep my composure, not to take pe people, my family members right out of the hospitals when I saw what they were feeding people. I'm like, you're, I don't understand. When a public hospital, all of them have land that could be used. We have food systems that could be put into the public school system. Every high school could have an orchard and a, and a, and a vineyard. And in partnering with, with organizations like Food Empowerment Project, we know how to locate the people who are skilled enough to do it. And we could pay them correctly so that they could do something that they know how to do and maybe actually find some joy out of it. Mm. So when I'm talking about what needs to happen in the urban areas is not trying to bring in animal agriculture into highly densely populated areas when they're telling us that the virus that we're all being affected by came from the interaction of animals and humans in too close a proximity. No. The solution is demanding that our public schools and our public parks and our public hospitals where we pay the land as the public, as the taxpayers, become food production sites. Uh. Sites of fruit production, medicinal and culinary herb production, and, and any kind of perennial plants so that we can utilize the very scarce water in, Ca in California to grow food for our communities. Bring back water. Wow. Yeah. But then you have you have the the big monster of privatization of land that you're up against. That's and water. Right. And water. And water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next it'll be air. <laughs> yeah. We're not for the we're not that far off from from having, you know, having uh oxygen be privatized. Yeah, you know that they, in um, uh, Bolivia, they try to private, privatize the water, which it would include the rain. Right, the rainwater. They're, they're, mm -hmm. trying to, they're trying to do that here, in some instances, where you can't collect rainwater. <laughs> so then, all the more reason to plant more trees, because the trees are the true water storage and filtration devices. So if, if we start to have all these silly problems, we're going to be forced back to doing what our grandmothers and grandfathers have told us a long time ago, which is save these seeds and plant these seeds. You know, all these seed banks that are buried in, in these icebergs and all that, that's cool, but the real seed bank is the planet. The way to save seeds is to plant them every year, not to mm. just put them in a jar somewhere. The mm. seed is saved in the fruit. It's just crazy wow. because uh, the imagery of just that of people in urban environments, raising animals, slaughtering am animals in their living environment, right? When, and I'm just thinking about growing up in Long Beach, California, and my babysitter who lived, we lived, and we lived, we didn't live in the suburbs, we lived in the hood, and she was from the south. They, everybody had their collard greens and their mustard, they had sugar cane, uh, but what is it, like stalks growing in their yard. You know what I'm saying? Even if your yard was just like a small plot yep. of grass, you had that. So why not encourage folks to do something like that? There, well, at least here, and it's really hard because when they have black or brown people talking about it, it's just painful, um, you know? But the whole thing is it's the protein. Uh, it's the protein. Which is ridiculous. I know, I know. But where's yeah. Doctor Mills. Where's Doctor Mills? So, so, so in Santa Ana, <laughs> right? I've done some work in Santa Ana years ago with an organization called the Grain Project, and they would get food from Trader Joe's, and um, every once a week the people would come out of their apartments to come and get the food from Trader Joe's that they were distributing, but it was happening in a community garden. But every one of these people, every one of the Latin fam Latinx families that I saw, were growing bananas avocados, lemons, limes, and oranges. Avocado don't have no protein? What are you talking about here? Right. Well, your beans don't have protein version of it. Right. <laughs> Aren't beans a protein? Exactly. I'm confused. I'm so confused by this silliness. We can't, I think we got to somehow stop entertaining these kinds of conversations and yeah. just send people to back to research and tell them, you 
you're not even coming with anything that even makes sense. You know, we, we need you to come back with some better solutions. And if you don't have them, we got 10 different people that you can talk to who have some better solutions. Because the public school land in Atlanta, these public schools are sitting vacant right now with the air conditioners running uh. and, and brothers still out mowing the lawn. Well, yeah, I think that, that for, I think what's frustrating is that in the communities that we've done focus groups and such, I mean, they're not exactly saying they don't have access to the animal products. What they're saying is they don't have access to the fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. So, I mean, that's, that's not, I mean, that's what makes working on this issue so <laughs> easy because what everybody's fighting for, vegan organization or not, is the fresh fruits and vegetables. Right. That's right. Right. That's right. So what are we doing? We should be planting. That should have told us that when they say the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, the next best time to plant a tree is now. Yeah. So, so right along in that, literally in that same vein, um, the two biggest objections that I get whenever I'm sitting in those meetings, you know, with the, the, the other nonprofit uh, food justice folks is um, one that the food system is too big to change, too big to change, right? You, you can't make any drastic changes, it's just too big. And the other one that is ex infuriating to me, anyway. right? The, the, other, the other thing that they say which is infuriating to me is that people will never agree to stop eating animals, right? And, and they're always, it's always uh, white people who are saying to me, you know, the people in the communities where we work, they're never going to agree to this. You mean the communities where they work or where they live? No, where they work. The exactly. Get out of that community and go work in the community where they live. Exactly. Because the, even going back to the conversation, there's, there have been movements in the last few years of, like, decolonize your diet, right? From an, an, an empowering perspective. And even when, we, when I did the um, Exploring Vegan Kenya, and I went to talk at the universities to um, a professor about veganic farming. She was like, well, one, we don't, it's that, that's just how, if, if you're a farmer, and more often you're poor as a farmer in Kenya because you got the gates there. You're already you got, a vegan. You got Monsanto there. We, can, we can't afford for animal inputs and fertilizer. We can't afford to buy that. So we are... Uh, reutilizing our green waste anyway. So we're organic farming just by nature. Mm. And then we look at the decolonize your diet movement, like the natural diets did, I mean, colonization brought the meat and the dairy and the highly processed foods and the sugar. So for us to go back to our diets before colonization is to go to plant-based or plant-centric. Well, that's, the thing is, but for me though, is that my ancestors diets weren't vegan right my right. ancestral i mean they ate eggs they ate insects right you know and so my whole thing always is like well you know can't we acknowledge that we don't maybe need to decolonize our diets as much as we need to recognize the impact that colonization has had on our diet mm, and so instead saying okay look for my ancestors columbus came on his fourth voyage brought over the cows all of a sudden we were introduced to this milk which the legacy of colonization is still impacting us, right? Why people call us lactose intolerant, whereas Food Empowerment Project prefers the term lactose normal. That there's nothing wrong with us, for one, not being able to digest the milk of another species, and two, not being able to digest something that, wasn't, that was part of colonization. So it's nothing wrong with us. We're not intolerant. We're actually normal. We are completely normal by our ancestral diets. Absolutely. So I, and so I feel like that, that there's like when people always say about decolonize your diet, I'm like, well, hold on, because I don't want to pretend because any Native American person is going to say, no, we weren't. We've not been vegan. Mm. We ate salmon. We ate this. Right, we right, ate, right, you know. Right, right. So I'm always like, no, well, let's just look then at the legacy of colonization on our diets now, though, and how much it's impacted us. And so it's just, yeah. And, and this what, is why I love, Brenda, that, uh -huh. you finally, that we finally got an opportunity to like have a conversation with Lauren. Oh my God. Because just the exchange of information and the perspective, you know what I mean? It broadens, you know, it broadens, uh, at least for me, my own personal knowledge and even the language 
and the the perspective and i i really really appreciate that because i do too my mind is like how do we get then somebody to work on just focusing on like growing the land we have i help people's garden right that's all volunteer in Vallejo. I mean, it's not ours. That's theirs. Always, it's it's always all volunteer. Always. And I'm like, and whenever we do our work, I'm like, we need to fund them. We need to get Vilma. She's Filipinx. That's the community we're working is Black, Filipinx, and Latinx. And I'm like, we need to get her to do this full time. This is outrageous. You know, that's why we're always like trying to get, here are these reports. Give them out to your funders. They need to know that you need this to do this full time because they should be the ones doing this work. But instead, you know, Who's getting the money? The food banks are getting the money, and they're they're giving moldy food to our people in our community. Absolutely, oh, believe me, I see Absolutely. it. I see it all the time working um, because you know we do food justice work, but ever since COVID we've been uh, moving more so into like food relief work because that was where like the greatest need was. And, you know, in going out into communities and doing um, food giveaways, we're always bringing like hot plant-based foods. Uh, whereas there, there's, you know, always a variety of people who are there giving away stuff. Uh, most of the stuff is from either large chain grocers. Um, so they, they get stuff from like Whole Foods. They get stuff from, you know, other places, Trader Joe's sometimes. But um, but also they will be um, getting stuff from the neighborhood convenience stores. So I guess they have uh, these connections with the people uh, who own the convenience store, the, the corner store and that kind of thing. And across the board, the food is always expired always expired. Nobody is giving away anything that they can't get money from. And, you know, and so it, it really, kind of, and, and I mean, you know, I've, I have been almost in tears at times, at times because, you know, the folks who are, you know, digging around in the boxes to try to find something that's edible, they're looking at us like, you know, this is molded. Like this, there's mold on, why would you give this to us? You know, and, well, and, I mean, we are bringing fresh food, you know, like, like that's yeah, kind of our like thing. Association. They were right. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. all I can do is apologize and, and, and just be like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that this is the current situation. And we're talking about entire families that come out there and line up for this food, you yeah. know? And so it, it's really, it's really despicable, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it, we throw away too much <laughs> food. 50% of the food that we grow in this country, we just throw away. You know, well, in our folk, in our um, serving, we actually found that a lot of the food in the convenience stores were already expired that they're selling our communities. Mind you, not even just um, say juices on the shelf, hand items, mm. which are supposed to be good for a long time, wow, were expired. So I'm they were. Surprised. I mean, again, these gro these convenience stores regularly sell sell for profit expired foods. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I would like to talk to you more, Lauren, about um, these kinds of surveys and and focus groups because I would love to be able to do yeah. stuff like that here. I we would love that. I mean, it's a lot of work. We always have people contact us, and our first question is, "Are you in the impacted community?" And trying to make sure they're not gentrifiers because mm -hmm. a lot of people want our survey tool because they want to gentrify, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we have like 14 pages of, especially it depends on the community, but since our survey tool is, is culturally appropriate for Vallejo, we had to do focus groups to determine what the Filipinx community, what produce they were more used to, the black community, what they were used to and what they wanted. We already had the Latinx community from Santa Clara, but so it's like 14 pages long, you know, you have to physically go in. We also asked to indicate like how many of a particular so you can say, oh, yeah, we sell apples. Well, you may have five. Or what we found was most of the limes were next to the tecate. They were next to the alcohol. So a liquor store would get credit for that, but it was placed near the alcohol. It wasn't like it was really there for, you know, foods that didn't have prices on them, right? So people who didn't speak English were an automatic disadvantage. And it was to divide, whoever was the, behind the counter could determine how much they wanted to charge. If you're black, I'm going to charge you a dollar for that banana. You're white, I'm gonna charge you 50 cents, 25 cents. Yeah. So I mean, this inherent discrimination that was kind of built into these situations. And it only comes out when you're actually surveying and you start to see this stuff on your own. Like you can see the alcohol, the Nesquik, you know, the chocolate milk signs and, the, and the, all the alcohol, all the cigarette signs in the windows. Yeah. You know, we found that, 
in the higher income areas, some of their grocery stores were open 24 hours. But in our communities, they closed at eight or nine o'clock. So you're working three jobs. What are you going to do? Well, the McDonald's, and literally my neighbor right across the street, McDonald's was open then from the grocery store. That was open later. So of course you're going to go and you're going to grab McDonald's for your kids before you get home from work. Mm. Yep. The system is set up for us to fail. And that's yep. the bottom line. So um, I wanted to ask you about some of the... Um, and any obstacles that you might uh, experience. Um, Lauren, in your work, what are the barriers that you've seen? And you've just been talking about this. So um, if you wanna elaborate at all on the barriers you've seen that prevent people from um, just jumping right in to a plant-based diet. Well, I think that one of the biggest barriers that's come out of our focus groups is literally the cost. It's expensive for people to be able to buy um, fresh produce. Um, and that exists because of autumn are getting their, their produce at liquor stores and convenience stores. So it's going to be more expensive. And so that's why one of the things that we really advocate and we really think that if every, if, if understandably, we, as vegans, we want people to stop consuming non-human animals to eliminate the harm that comes to them. Absolutely. But what vegans need to be doing and everybody needs to be doing is fight for living wages because we need more equity. Without equity in order to rise everybody up, people aren't going to be able to access the healthy foods. And so that to me, that's part of doing veganism is advocating for people to make more money so they can afford the food because we don't need food prices to go down, right? I mean, farm workers aren't already being paid enough. The grocery store workers aren't all these workers aren't being paid enough. We don't need the cost of food to go down. We need everybody's wages to go up to create some equity for everybody. So in order for people to be able to access the healthy food, they need to be able to have the money to afford it. So I, across the board, fast food workers, grocery store workers, Walmart workers, city, state, county, any level where you can fight for living wages, we need to add our voice to that. We, we're activists, right? We need to add our voices to this and make sure that we advocate for living wages. So cost is one of the biggest barriers. Another big barrier is people who are time poor and cash poor. Not my coin term, somebody else's, but a really important thing when you consider that people are working multiple jobs in order to help make ends meet. So they don't have the time, they don't have the ability. It's not that they don't have the interest. In all of our focus groups, people knew they wanted to, to buy healthy foods. In fact, again, many of them, who were immigrants were used to eating healthier in the countries that they came from. It's not that they didn't know, they wanted to, but they didn't have the ability to. They had to, you know, in some communities, you're talking about people would have to take multiple buses to get to go and buy food. We're talking about people who stand out in the cold and the rain just to catch a bus to be able to access healthy foods. We also know that food is not always culturally appropriate, right? So a lot of the foods that many people say from the Philippines, or the Latinx communities or other immigrants, those aren't always the foods that are available to them in their community. So they may not know exactly how to cook something like that. They may need, you know, why, you know, we may need to do more education and cooking classes. It's not always necessarily because people don't know how to, um, although I will say I know nothing about cooking. Um, but um, some of it's also because people have to learn to cook new foods. How do you cook this? Because this isn't what I grew up with. And so they, they will need some, you know, understanding about that. Um, and I think that as well, another barrier is the fact that, that there's still this mindset of animal consumption, right? So like I talked about before, that you can go into some of these communities and you'll find milk there, cow's milk there, but that isn't necessarily what's best for the health of the community, right? So the person's going to buy the milk. Their kid's not going to feel good. They're going to have stomach aches. They're going to go to school. They're not going to feel good at school. Then they're not going to learn. They're not going to do well in their education. And it creates a cycle. So instead of recognizing that plant-based milks are what's better for us, thanks to advertising, thanks for the USDA, thanks for that entire industry, we don't go readily to understand. And we need to do more to explain. And I'll say right here, I don't mean white vegans need to explain it. I mean, we need to be talking to our communities about how colonization absolutely is continuing its legacy. And that's why we have to talk honestly about the, pro the issue that we're lactose normal and be proud about that for one thing. Um, the fact that it's part of our ancestral heritage 
And it's also part of saying it's not really normal to drink milk as an, another species. So I think that those are some of the barriers that people experience some of. I mean, there's a whole lot more. I mean, we go into the fact that a lot of people in these communities, which is a very, very painful thing that when I first learned about it really is still something I struggle with, that a lot of people, everything that they're eating comes out of a microwave. You know, they live in hotels, maybe six people in a hotel and everything they eat's coming out of that microwave. And how do we fix that? Whew. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues. Um, and those are the, the basic, those are like the, the pillars uh, that basically hold up um, the, you know, the, the thrust of the the work that i do um there's like accessibility obviously um that you know if it's not there and people you know most people they eat what's there they eat what's in the community um and 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 the the less privileged you are the more you have to do that like you were saying lauren um because like if you don't have a car or if you um you know live in a rural area or something like that um you know you you have to eat what's close, close by. Well, and, and one of the things too, just to hi highlight this a little bit, because of what you're saying is that grocery stores, at least Safeway, which also goes by the name Albertsons, is also responsible for creating these problems. And they are one of the barriers for people accessing healthy food. So in the community we're working in, Safeway was located in a downtown area, black, brown community members living there, seniors living there, older people living there. And they moved from that location, moved miles away and put a restrictive deed on their former property saying no grocery store can move here for 15 years. So you have teenagers and we have quotes from people saying that, you know, they literally had to buy all of their groceries from the convenience stores and liquor stores and try to make deals with the owners to get them fresh produce. Yeah. And this is something that's taking place across the United States. It's taking place in Washington, D.C. It's taking place in Washington State right now in a predominantly farm worker community. We're safely a grocery store that should be in the practice of giving people access to healthy foods is literally the one depriving them. Because some of these restrictive deeds have gone on for 15, 20, 30, 60 years, literally devastating communities and their health. That's that's warfare. That's strategic warfare. That's a tactic. Yeah. Yep. And we can't get vegans to jump on board with it, even though they should look at themselves and say, if there was Safeway around, people could buy vegan food. No, we still can't get enough signatures on our petition against Safeway when they're literally hurting the health of Black and Brown communities, deliberately hurting the health. Well, and they can definitely find more information about that campaign. Uh, it's called Shame on Safeway, correct? Exactly. Um, on the that. Food Empowerment. In addition to, like, I was on the Food Empowerment Project website uh, recently for about three hours. Right? <laughs> and I still didn't see everything. I mean, people really, really need to check out this website. It's just such a treasure trove of you know, just information and education and, you know, advocacy and inspiration, you know, all those recipes. And, you know, it's just, it's a really, really, and, and, you know, um, we're, we're definitely going to be making sure that people know where they can contact you, where they can find more information about um, the work that you do. Uh, and, and so for me, you know, accessibility, affordability, like you talked about Lauren, and then, um, uh, relatability is the other one. So you hit on all of these things. Like, you know, you can, there, there are folks uh, here in Baltimore who, you know, bleeding heart, uh, folks who decided like, you know, well, we've pinpointed healthy, lack of healthy food access being the issue, you know, that, that needs to be addressed within these low income black communities in Baltimore. And so, you know, they got all this funding, you know, whereas, people like me didn't get any funding uh, for like to build the community gardens that we wanted to build. But these folks who don't even live in the, in our communities got all this funding to come in and build these community gardens. And they, I guess they just thought it was going to be a, like, if they build it, if we build it, they will come situation, but they were growing things like watercress and like, you know, arugula. And, and I'm not saying like, 
<laughs> that you shouldn't, you know, grow things and introduce people to new things and all that kind of stuff. But it was like the people in the community didn't even know what that was. They were like, I don't know what that is. And these folks were getting frustrated with the community because they were like, we brought all these things into this community and you people don't even appreciate it. And so there was this big rift where, you know, these, these people, like, they got all this funding, they came in, they built these community gardens, they got frustrated with the community for, not, for continuing to go to the convenience store for their food when, hey, there's this perfectly good artichoke right here that you need to be, per you know, and, and we'll even give it to you, and, you know, and, and they never went to the community and said, what do you want us to grow? They never connected with the community at all. Like, would you like to learn how to, to grow food? None of that. They just came in as saviors. And when they didn't get the response that they felt like they were due they got frustrated and they pulled out. And now you have all these lots that are just overgrown all over Baltimore, you know, where, you know, the folks. You know what? Those folks got paid, though. Oh, yeah. So oh, when, they they pulled out, when they pulled out, they pulled out with the money that they got for doing those programs. And people in the hood are not fools. Yeah. They know people's motivation for coming into their neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's, that's why we started doing the focus groups, because it's always our fault, right? Oh, well, we, we did a farmer's market, but they weren't going. Well, did you ask them what time they wanted to do it? What mm. day was best for them? Did you, did you make sure it was the language appropriate for the people who lived in the community? I'm sorry, because it seems like you actually did it. So that people on their lunch hour could go into and buy it versus the people who are working like jobs where they get like a half an hour lunch for 15 minute break. So, mm -hmm. you know, they don't ask the community and talk to the community. They make the decisions and then they blame us when they don't succeed. Mm. Javonna, I was going to ask you, um, in the work that you're doing with like the school lunch program, as well as the, uh, the pregnant and postpartum moms, have you um, experienced any resistance to um, plant-based eating with the folks that you're working with? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's because with the schools, no. I haven't had any resistance. They, they come to me knowing that that's what I offer, right? Um, and then even like when we have like programs here and that's what we offer up to people, people are not like, Oh, you know, there, no, I haven't had any resistance. <laughs> I haven't had any resistance. That's really interesting. And maybe that's, uh, I guess I'm, the only resistance that I've, if, if I've had resistance has been when I have sat down with people who are trying to help me to negotiate like my business or organizational structure. And they have the issue with, well, if you offer something else other than plant-based that's the only time that i have issues when i'm dealing with organizations or when it comes to like funding or things like that but when i'm dealing with the people there's no resistance when it comes to me being plant-based or organizations being plant-based it's only when it gets into like business or yeah all that other stuff that it becomes an issue but no no because i mean <laughs> we're dealing with humans people just they want to feel good. They want to eat good. They're not, you know, <laughs> and it's, yeah, no, no. Just to be concise, no, I don't have any resistance from the people that I serve. Okay. Yeah, and I, uh, we're offering, a lot of what we offer is um, is classes, workshops, you know, educational programs, and, and a lot of, um, like, fun events, too, like festivals and, and um, competitions and things like that. And so people are, are coming to us like you were saying, they're coming to us to, uh, to, for something different or to learn more about it or, you know, just to see what this is about. So um, we don't get a lot of resistant, resistance there. Um, I was wondering, Lauren, um, so, so Food Empowerment Project is only going to go into a community when, um, when invited which I definitely respect. Um, when you do go into a community though, like Vallejo or, um, is it Vallejo or Vallejo? Right. Well, I, it's Vallejo, but as I'm told a lot that I'm one of the only people who calls it that. Ah, uh, <laughs> gotcha. So most people are used to it being Vallejo. So okay. I automatically switch back and forth. 
Got you. <laughs> so, so in going um, into a community like that, do you um, experience any resistance? Because I know that you're you're not going to compromise. Like you're not going to come in and be like, and here's your meat option, right? So, um, do you um, have you um, experienced any resistance in that? Well, when we first, uh, so it kind of again, like it all started because I went to this event about the Black Panther Party feeding, doing the free breakfast programs. And again, that wasn't vegan or even vegetarian, um, but they were doing it. And um, David and I connected because I wanted to learn more about how they were doing it. And I showed him the reports we'd done in Santa Clara County, which is where I had lived. And he was like, you know, I want you to do this here where I live. And I was like, okay, but you know, we're a vegan group, so we're really only going to survey about vegan foods, and it's all, and he was like, yes, it's fine, I should probably be vegan anyway. So then from there, you know, I wanted to make sure we had more community support for what we were doing, and so I met with um, the Filipinx women who started Vallejo People's Garden, and they knew too, when they're like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, they didn't, it was, again, but I think it's because what we're trying to do is get more produce in the community anyway. But when we have, you know, we have our events, our community events, we have um, our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest, which thank you again for being a part of this year. Um, it isn't that big of a deal. Nobody says anything about it. Um, and so we don't get any resistance, right? But that doesn't mean that everybody's like, I'm adopting a vegan diet. And part of that is because they don't even have access to the, we're not really pushing veganism as much as we're doing education in a sense, because we know that community doesn't have the access to the healthy foods. You know, we can't go in there and be talking about this stuff when it'd be like, oh yeah, you can't get this product here. You can't get this product here either. You can't get any of this. Oh yeah, you can't even get these fruits and vegetables here. You know, so we're very cognizant of that, but we're, one of the solutions we see other than growing your own food are worker-owned cooperatives, where the workers are the owners and they're the ones who make the decisions on the profits. They're the ones who make decisions on what they sell, that the money stays in the community, and it should be the people who work there um, should be from, are from the community as well. So we've been working with Mandela Grocery um, to bring something like that there. And one of our community meetings that we had, we did three community meetings um, introducing Mandela to the community um, to talk about why a worker-owned cooperative would be a solution. So I'm somebody who's never lived anywhere where I could grow anything. Um, so a worker-owned cooperative in another way other than growing your own food has to be part of the solution. And so um, in this meeting, somebody looked at me and said, so Lauren, is this Food Empowerment Project cooperative, is it going to be only selling vegan food? And I said, look, first of all, it's going to be your cooperative. We're not going to be a part of it. You're the owners. You're going to make the decisions. And if you decide that it's not going to be vegan, all I can tell you is I'm going to be back here constantly telling you why you should go vegan and giving you vegan foods and why you should be eating vegan. But I can't do that until you actually have the access. So that's going to be up to you. But once you have the options, and if it's not going to be vegan, then my job and my role changes. Eugene, so in, in terms of the type of gardening that you do, um, and like, so again, you're training people to do gardening with, uh, excuse me, farming without um, using animal products. Is there ever any resistance to that at all? There's resistance in the fact that um, people have limited experience and limited knowledge. So people, farmers in general, um, I guess older farmers tend to in general think that they know best. And, and um, so they'll tell you, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. So one of the reasons why we have focused on the youth is for that reason is because a lot of the young people are already living a plant-based lifestyle themselves and they don't have the um, prejudices of having farmed another way. So, and because we're looking at it practically, the, the, there's a couple um, organizations that I've been in communication with, vegan organizations that are embarking on like farm transformations where they go to farmers who were chicken farmers or cattle farmers and are trying to get them transformed into doing vegan agriculture. And so they've contacted me as a consultant. And my main issue with them is not the fact that these people used to be animal farmers. It's that we're focusing money and resources on people who are 60 years old and over. Like, what's the point? If I'm gonna train a farmer in veganic farming, 
I'm, we're focusing on people 18 to 36 years old because they don't have all these preconceived notions and they're already into a different lifestyle. They already are open and their introduction to farming is veganic farming if they come to grow where you are. So it's not like they're being introduced to something new. They're being introduced and in how to grow food, period. This is how we grow food. If they didn't see the results, they wouldn't be interested. Mm -hmm. The reason people deal with us are not because, I mean, the restaurants that we've been selling to in, throughout Atlanta are not vegan restaurants. And they're not buying us our produce because it's veganically grown. They're buying it because it's the best produce, period. They're buying it for the flavor, for the consistency. So our focus is making sure that we're growing good food. Our focus is training people that are young enough and um, open enough and receptive enough that we can just usher in a new process that will never be questioned because it will be the standard. So when we look at these organizations who are pouring their funding into coming to older white farmers who used to kill animals and saying, hey, we want to transform your land into veganic agriculture, again, it looks like a, a misallocation of resources. When we have people who are in right in the middle of these urban communities who have been doing volunteer gardening for however long and need to be getting paid. We're focusing, I've seen uh, organizations who want to focus my attention and their resources on, on white folks who already own their land, already own 100, 200, 300 acres. I'm thinking, but they're already at, re at retirement age. Uh. Why would I get involved in a project like that? And when I tell them clearly, I think these are bad ideas, and I have some better ideas that are gonna that are already in motion. There, that's where the resistance comes in. The resistance actually comes from people in the vegan movement who are not farmers, but are grabbing hold of an idea and want to be the first organization to have a successful prototype uh -huh. of a bad idea. So, no, the young people, the people we're training, our organ, uh, our program is called Growing Options and Growing Options is literally that. It's introducing young people, black and brown people, women of color to the food system in its entirety from distribution, production, creating added value products. And we're doing it through a vegan lens, but what we're teaching them are skill sets that are applied throughout the food system. And it doesn't really, it, you know, they can choose that way or not that way, but that's what we're going to choose. So we're teaching them about added value products, about restaurants, about distribution, about production through that lens, as opposed to going to somebody who's been killing animals for 30 years and saying, can you reuse your land this way to grow mushrooms? And we're going to underwrite it and pay for it when these people are, are I mean, people are sitting on hundreds of acres of land. So they have wealth and resources. Already. You know, it's, <laughs> This, we're, we're in such an interesting area because people come to me for consultation and I've never taken one single course in agriculture. I've never been to school for agriculture. I've never studied agriculture in a formalized, structured setting. I know it from doing it and from having amazing mentors and amazing teachers. But when I'm being contacted now, I'm being contacted by people who are at the top of their organizational tree and they say they want to talk to me until I share with them that their ideas are bad. And then suddenly, they're no longer, they no longer have the same kind of respect for me that they used to because they want me to tell them that their ideas are good. What you are doing is a good idea, Brenda. What Lauren's been doing, I've been educated since I first was made in contact with Food Empowerment Project. That's who I want to work with. And so I tell them over and over again, if you want me to work on any of these projects, I already know who the partners should be. And, and um, our work is called food justice work because the main driving force behind it is to address the multiple injustices that our current system is built on. In all honesty, many of the injustices happening in our food system are happening right under our noses, right under everybody's noses, and most people don't even realize it. Are there any particular aspects of the current food system that are not commonly known that the three of you think that people should know about? And I want to start with Lauren um, and, and, and ask you, is there any particular uh, aspect of the current food system um, 
that that you feel like people you know don't know about but maybe participating in or you know that you think should be highlighted well i think i talked about two of them one is what safeway is doing what i don't think a lot of people know about that i don't think people actually recognize that a lot of people are living in hotels and we don't think about the people who are experiencing homelessness when we talk about these issues and i don't mean that in terms of handouts again i mean that in terms of creating systems in which people aren't experiencing homelessness and are able to provide for themselves. But I think that, you know, some of it is that we don't look at all the commodities that we eat and the fact that all the suffering that goes along through it. And I just want to bring like an example of Ben and Jerry's um, because I'm annoyed. One, I'm annoyed that vegans continue to eat Ben and Jerry's even though they're owned by Unilever, which tests on animals. And two, that Ben and Jerry seems to get a pass. Ben and Jerry's may make a vegan ice cream. They put out this statement that everybody's very happy about, about Black Lives Matter. And absolutely and utterly applaud that, right? Good for them. But where is the action in terms of their supply chain, right? So where is the action in terms of the fact that we know that they're sourcing chocolate from areas where child labor and slavery are most prevalent? What about those Black lives in Western Africa? How are they making sure that those Black lives matter? And what are they doing to do things differently for them? What are they doing differently for their own employees? Are all their employees making living wages? Because that's one way to show that Black Lives Matter is by giving, making sure that they are being paid what they're worth and what they should be paid. So I think that a lot of times we get blinded by corporations who um, maybe are saying the right things or that make vegan products, but we're not looking at the full supply chain and where it's coming from. We are looking at wine maybe to make sure that it's vegan, but what about the farm workers and how they're treated? So I think that we, we limit where we're, where we're going. And, so, and again, I admit like this is overwhelming, right? The food, the empowerment projects work is overwhelming because then all of a sudden I'm gonna throw out coffee and I'm gonna throw out bananas, you know, and it's gonna be overwhelming. But I think that we need to be more aware of all these different ways in which our food connects and the ways that we can't just limit how we view it. We can't just have a corporation say Black Lives Matter and then they're selling chocolate that's sourced from areas where slavery and child labor are the most prevalent. We can't let that stand. And so, you know, and again, I don't, we don't want to take away from them saying that because absolutely it's important in the United States that that be said and people and corporations let themselves be known by where they stand. But we need more action in what it is than the, when these things are being said, especially by corporations. Giovanna, is there any particular thing, um, you know, about our food system that that you can think of that, you know, that people may not know about, but that you feel like they should? Mm. What came to mind just when you first asked the question is just the low levels of nutrition that are pushed upon our, I mean, the highly processed foods that are pushed upon our children in the school system, so with school lunches. Um, and also uh, thinking about um, what Eugene mentioned earlier when it comes specifically to the pregnant and postpartum mothers in hospitals and the foods and um, that they have access to and things that are given to them when they're in the hospital. Just, just we, like, I think that's not a conversation that we often have. It's like the foods that's been given to our children in schools and then also what's given to, um, like, our pregnant and postpartum mothers when they're in like institutions like hospitals and, and care facilities as well. So well, that would be two things that I would like to go into the conversation. Okay. And Eugene? Yeah, I think I'll, at this point, I really want to add in the really important work of um, Acres of Ancestry. You can check them out on Instagram. And Acres of Ancestry is an organization that's been addressing the black land loss, black farmer land loss that's been generational through USDA uh, trickery. Um, the Pigford versus board of uh, the USDA. That's a case where we've seen that 98% of rural farmland in America is owned by white people. And that doesn't make any sense considering how many black farms there were after um, reconstruction. So the land loss, the black land loss is something that I think it's talked about, but it's not really um, known 
that it has a huge monetary impact. It also has huge nutrition impacts because we have elder black farmers who now have been fighting to have debt uh, removed, to ha get their land out of foreclosure. Many of them have lost thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. The USDA has decided that they had closed the case with the Pigford case and paid out a certain amount of money to a few small groups of different farmers, but the majority of black farmers are still um, in debt or have lost their land and it's not been addressed. And that is the land that we desperately need to put back into production with the new group of young um, interested growers that we're training in urban areas. They need to be able to matriculate out into this rural land and have this land that has been secured by black farmers passed on to a new generation of black farmers. So I would say people need to check out Acres of Ancestry and see the work that they're doing. Thanks for mentioning that. One of our advisory board members is one of the people whose land was taken in Louisiana and he's been fighting it. I met one of the attorneys who's been doing that. Just a really quick story. She was saying how when the um, when they were taking over like the grandmother's land and they said look we have proof right here she was handing it over and they said look here's her ex and they said my grandmother wrote her name uh. that's how they were able to prove that they were lying that the bank was lying because they tried to say she put her ex there without knowing that this black woman she was knew how to write her own name she knew how to write she knew how to do all that and it was just like that's what that's what you're dealing with mm. uh-huh yeah, Tracy McCurdy might be the the lawyer you're talking about. She's doing amazing work, and she's yeah. She, I mean, these people she, are the fear she has driving through the neighborhood. I was like, hey, can you tell me when you're driving through these? We will try to get some of our supporters out there to be with you to make sure you're okay. Yeah, she's amazing. Absolutely. So the the title of this uh, panel discussion, or the topic, I should say, of this panel discussion is, what would a just and sustainable food system look like? And I'm really interested to know, for the three of you, um, what a just and sustainable food system would look like to you? And I mean, I know that's a huge question. So I guess <laughs> I'm just asking, like, if you could, you know, kind of boil it down. Um, and with the understanding that obviously you're not gonna be able to like cover every single thing. I think one that it does is not causing deliberate harm or intentional harm to any living being um, where people are able to live and thrive um, and where we look at food starting from the minute that it's planted or I guess is even um, Eugene would say like the, the soil even uh, making sure that's okay but that the people are taken care of throughout the supply chain from the people who are planting to harvesting to the truck drivers, the people who are selling it, everybody who's a part of that supply chain down to the restaurant's um, uh, dishwasher. That everybody in that full supply chain is treated with respect and dignity and paid their worth. Um, and also non-human animals and human animals would not be exploited as part of the process. That their essential needs are met and their ability to thrive, to actually have some type of life of enjoyment um, again, human and non-human animals, I think is critical. And I think that to me, sustainability isn't just about the earth. It's about the people and the animals being able to be sustained themselves. I think about people having choice, um, being empowered and to have autonomy um, over like their food system. Um, so that like they have the ability to have a hand in their food system, right? Um, and then they have the ability to have choice about what food is in their environment that they have access to, be it through them actually being producers themselves um, and being educated and encouraged in that, or them having the ability to be in a position where they can speak to and um, have a say in what comes into their environment. Um, yeah, and then just, uh, yeah, the big piece of us just be education of how um, we can all work within harmony with the earth and within our community and environments to um, create balance. 
but I think justice will come out of systems of balance. So. Yeah, there's a farmer here in Atlanta named Ross Kofi, and he always says, there's no culture without agriculture. And so in alignment with, or including everything that Lauren and Giovanna said, I would say um, a just food system is about like food sovereignty and land sovereignty go hand in hand. So we need to have the producers of the food living where they produce the food, having the ability to own and steward the land where they are producing the food, and then have similar to the Zapatistas have the educational institutions and the communication institutions be right there on that same land. When we have systems, when we create these systems where the land ownership and stewardship is, is in cooperative ownership of the people who are producing the food, then from the beginning, we start in a better situation. All of our root cultures started along Nile, uh, along rivers like the Nile or, or, or any of the rivers in Mexico or in Central America. We started our cultures and civilizations along rivers so that we could stabilize the agriculture. And there was no way in the world that the people who were producing the food in the great Mayan and Toltec and, and uh, Kemetic civilizations, there's no way that those farmers could have been looked at and treated the way we are treating farm workers and farmers now and still have had great civilizations. Uh. Obviously, they were looked at in a very different light. And so we need to have a fundamental shift of being able to look at people who dedicate their life to the production of food as valuable, sophisticated, caring, intelligent beings. We need to start to see them as that and then honor them as such, and then our entire civilization will flourish. We've already seen the success of that. It's not like some fantasy. When we go and look at these pyramids and look at these ancient civilizations, they're along rivers for a reason. And they say what they began with was these core crops. They talk about the crops with more reverence than they talk about the people who grew the crops. That's what happens in colonization, is that the crops are talked about, but the people who grew them are not. But the civilizations that created these lasting impressions of art and culture started with by honoring those men and women who planted the seeds and cared for the plant. So what Navdanya, what uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva is doing with Navdanya, what Wangari Madai was doing with the Greenbelt Movement, we need to what, what Pierre Rabi is doing with agroecology, we need to to begin to venerate and uh, and uplift those who are constantly bowing to the earth every single day. Mm. This has been amazing. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, thank Giovanna. You. Thank you, Eugene, for thank being you. a part of this. You, <sighs> did, you did this. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, for having me be here and creating this, and also just creating a great space right. and a safe space. Like you said, you absolutely created that safe space. And so thank you for that. It's this was an honor. This was an absolute honor. Um, so thank you for your time. I know all of your time, you know, all of our time is really, really just valuable. And, and you should be doing this though, Brenda. This is what we should be doing right now. Thank I you. agree. And I'm honored. Um, I would love to uh, uh, take this time to say thank you um, so much to the people who uh, have tuned in to this wonderful panel um, who uh, you know, I'm sure have gotten so much from the wisdom and, and the knowledge that was imparted uh, from these food justice activists today. Can I just ask really quickly um, if you if you could tell people like who are going to be inspired, they're going to want to know, you know, how can I support? How can I volunteer? How can I be a part of what you're doing? Um, and then like starting from Eugene to um, Giovanna to Lauren, um, can you just tell people how they can um, plug in like website or, or whatever? Absolutely, Grow Where You Are, uh, Grow Where You Are has a Patreon page. So anybody who's familiar with Patreon, it's a way that you can long-term support uh, organizations and creative people. So growwhereyouare.farm is our website. It'll take you to the link to our Patreon. And we're on Instagram at Grow Where You Are. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Maita Foods, so M-A-I-T-U-F-O-O-D-S dot com. Also, my handle is at Maita Foods um, on Instagram. Okay. 
Lauren? Um, well, what they can do, I would say, is always to support Black, Brown, um, Indigenous-led vegan organizations that actually have an eye to the social justice issues that don't just promote veganism, but also look at all the other issues related to our food system, um, talking about racism and just, yeah, I just think it's really important for all this work to be supported. Um, and so for Food Empowerment Project, we're on um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And our website is foodispower.org, and it's available in English and in Spanish. We also have veganmexicanfood.com in English and in Spanish, and vegan Filipino food in English and Tagalo. And soon we hope to have vegan Lao food in English and Lao. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you all so, so much again. And I look forward to working with all of you more. I mean, it's going to happen. I'm going to be calling you up again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I look forward to always talking with all three of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And your team. Yeah. Yes, indeed. All right. Until next time. Bye. 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 Thanks for tuning into this session. Support Afro-Vegan Society's work by donating today. Click to watch more videos from the World Food Day series.